Hello, and welcome to the Drug Discovery World podcast, a podcast covering topics around drug discovery and development, pharma and biotech. My name is Giles, and I'm here to take you through this episode. Today's episode is taken from our summer 2016 issue, and is titled The Human Microbiome, A New Frontier in Drug Discovery. The article was written by Lee Jones, who is the founder, president and CEO of Rebiotics, a clinical stage biotechnology company focused on harnessing the power of the human microbiome to revolutionise the treatment of challenging diseases. So now on to the main article, The Human Microbiome, A New Frontier in Drug Discovery. There is a new phenomenon sweeping the globe, or at least sweeping the imagination of people around the globe. And this is the human gut microbiome, and the role it may play in the future of human health. Recent reports have indicated that the human gut microbiome may be implicated in a whole variety of health conditions, such as metabolism, obesity, diabetes, immunity, and autism. If you can name it, there has probably been something written about the condition and the gut microbiome. One thing is for certain, and that is, the gut microbiome has a role in protecting the human host from disease. The author too caught the bug, pun intended, when she first learned about the gut microbiome and heard about faecal transplants. She became fascinated with how the microbes in faecal material could be used to solve an unmet medical need. People who had experienced multiple recurrences of a nasty gastrointestinal disease called Clostridium difficile infection. CDI, and who had no good alternatives. At the time, the author did not know exactly what CDI was, but it sounded bad and seemed to be something that needed to be solved. The author then learned that the number of people getting this disease was growing, and that it was harder to treat with existing antibiotics. It dawned on her, as she learned more, that her own family had fallen victim to this disease multiple times, and here, right before her, was a potential cure that had been demonstrated to work. This was a moment where she remembered thinking she might just be witnessing the dawn of a new era where the use of the human microbiome could revolutionise the way medicine would be practised in the future. That was in 2011. At the time, one could find very little, if any, mainstream information about the human microbiome. Contrast that to when this article was published. In May 2016, the White House announced the National Microbiome Initiative, with $121 million in federal and $400 million in private funds to promote the study and use of the microbiome. This timeline, from obscurity to the spotlight for a technical initiative, is like stomping on the gas in a sports car and going from 0 to 160 in two seconds. Prior to the Microbiome Initiative, over the past few years, Numerous companies have taken the concept of the microbiome as a therapeutic to the next stage by developing commercial products. Rebiotics was the first company to take a microbiome-based product as a drug through the FDA, and its product for the prevention of recurrent CDI was the most clinically advanced. Ceres Therapeutics, which also has a CDI prevention product, but one that is based on a limited microbial mix that forms spores, was the first microbiome company to go public through an IPO. Second Genome, Vedanta, Enterome, and Synlogic, all microbiome companies, have recently closed financing rounds, signalling that the race is on to the market, and that the market is real. So what's happened to drive a relatively unknown concept to global prominence in a few years? With regards to the gut microbiome, the author believes that it had a lot to do with the ubiquitous nature of the source of the microbes, human faecal material, and the ability of anyone to acquire it and use it in research. And not just bench research, but human clinical research, including the citizen scientists trying it themselves in the privacy of their own homes. The fascination with the potential of gut microbiome-based therapies, and the broad and fast scope of research, has led to the birth of a new industry including new therapeutics and diagnostics for human and animal health and disease, new test methods, new libraries of knowledge about previously unknown microbes, 
and new methods to collect and manipulate vast quantities of data. We can imagine that we have only seen a tiny piece of what will surely grow over the years, opening up all sorts of opportunities. So what is the gut microbiome? What functions does it perform? What happens when the gut microbiome gets disrupted? How does that happen? These are just a few of the questions that scientists and others are trying to answer. Let us start with Human Microbiome 101. Microbes and other organisms inhabit our surfaces and collectively outnumber our own human cells. The vast majority of these are a community composed of trillions of microorganisms that reside in the human intestinal tract and make up the human gut microbiome. These microorganisms live in concert with each other and their human host, and share important functions including processing otherwise indigestible components of our diet and making essential nutrients that allow us to live. In other words, without the gut microbiome, we as humans would not survive. Interestingly enough, a healthy human's gut microbiome, as measured by the microbiota in the faeces, are dominated by two bacterial phyla, Bacterioides and Formicutes. Does that mean that all human microbiomes are alike? Well, while there are differences at the species level, to the point where no two individuals are exactly alike, it is now understood that functionally most people are similar, and most people have a common set of microbes at some level that look like everyone else's. Our microbiomes are influenced by what we eat, where we live, who we live with, how old we are, and what pets we have, so the composition is bound to be different between us. Where the observed difference in microbiome composition is much larger is between those people who are generally healthy and those people who are generally ill. The National Institute of Health Common Fund Human Microbiome Project, HMP, was established to generate research resources to enable the characterization of the human microbiota and the analysis of their role in human health and disease. The foundation of the work done in the first phase, 2007 to 2012, was to characterize the microbiome of approximately 242 healthy individuals from the US. The generated dataset has been used as a basis for the representation of a healthy person's microbiome, and is often used to characterize a microbiome as healthy. Actually, we're not too sure that there is a singular healthy microbiome. But what the author does believe is that sick people, particularly people who have experienced multiple episodes of CDI where the author has experience, have a gut microbiome that is dominated by a different set of microbiota than those people who have not experienced the disease. Using CDI as an example, the occurrence of the disease can be attributed to the disruption of the gut microbiota, where the person who has a compromised gut microbiome gets exposed to the Clostridium difficile C. Diff, organism and is unable, due to a lack of normal microbiota community, to resist the subsequent infection. How does the microbiome get disrupted? For CDI, this occurs primarily as a result of antibiotic usage where the antibiotics are taken to treat an underlying condition, such as a urinary tract infection. When this happens, and C. diff is introduced into the altered gut environment, the C. diff replicates and produces toxins. At some point, the toxin wrecks havoc on the lining of the large intestine and causes profuse watery diarrhea, the hallmark CDI symptom. To reduce the number of C. diff organisms, and therefore toxin production, to stop the diarrhea, the standard of care is to dose the patient with more antibiotics. For some people this works well, and their normal microbiome restores itself, preventing further CDI. Unfortunately, for many people, their gut microbiome is so compromised that just diminishing the C. diff number is not enough. The disease comes back after antibiotic therapy is discontinued. If you were to be one of those unlucky individuals, you might be condemned to a life of on-again, off-again antibiotics, permanent antibiotic therapy, possibly having your colon removed, or death, none of which are desirable to say the least. Fortunately, it is this very instance, for a current CDI, that microbiome-based therapies have demonstrated an ability to prevent future recurrences of the disease by restoring the damaged microbiome to a more normal state. As mentioned earlier, 
The normal microbiome provides a measure of protection to the person and prevents C. diff colonization and subsequent toxin production. The earliest and crudest form of microbiota-based therapeutic are fecal transplants. Fecal transplants, FT, have been used for centuries to treat gastrointestinal diseases. In the United States, the pivotal reference is a publication in 1958 by Dr. Ben Eisman and his colleagues, a team of surgeons from Colorado, who treated four critically ill patients with fecal enemas for pseudomembranous enterocolitis caused by what they thought was a Staphylococcus infection, before C. difficile was a named microbe. Until recently, Fecal transplants were offered as a treatment of last resort for patients who had experienced multiple episodes of CDI, where antibiotics provided only a temporary relief of symptoms. The procedure was messy and time-consuming. A donor needed to be found, usually someone known by the patient, the fecal material gathered, and the product manufactured and delivered by the doctor. This normally had to happen within a few hours of the stool donation to ensure the viability of the microbes and there was little or no money to be made by the treating physician. Several case studies were published over the years showing anecdotal effectiveness of the therapy, with few reports of adverse events. In 2013, that all changed with the publication in the New England Journal of Medicine of the first randomised controlled trial of faecal transplant. It demonstrated a significant benefit of the therapy over vancomycin, with limited side effects. Suddenly, FT emerged as the treatment. Patients started clambering for the therapy because they were desperate for a cure, and it didn't stop there. Soon, FTs were being used for nearly every condition, all despite a lack of evidence of safety and efficacy. Patients travelled across continents to get the treatment, and in some cases, spent multiple thousands of dollars and lots of effort to track down treating physicians. As with many new promising therapies, the hype has preceded the actual evidence, leading many to wonder whether, as a potential therapeutic, will the microbiome be a sustainable technology, or will it become an unfulfilled promise buried under the sheer volume of noise being generated? The author believes, from what they've witnessed in their own drug development program, that it is promising and it is possible to develop it to its full potential, but only if there is some discipline implemented in the field as microbiota therapeutics are being developed. In the author's frame of reference as a long-term medical technology executive, a therapeutic product only becomes commercially viable when it has undergone rigorous clinical trials for safety and efficacy as part of an FDA regulatory process and has earned regulatory approval. Developing a microbiota-based therapeutic has been challenging. When the author first started Rebiotics, they thought, how hard can it be? The raw material is poop, and people have been dealing with that forever. Just goes to show how wrong one can be. Human stool is a complex mix of live organisms and dead, undigested food and human components that are shared on a daily basis. At Rebiotics, they were interested in harvesting the live microbes, but no one knew how to do that or how to tell what and how many live microbes were in the mix. In addition to that, they only wanted the good microbes, not the bad ones. It took them a year to develop the test methods that they could use to characterise the product. Without a test, they could not tell if the processes or materials they were using were helping or hurting the microbes they were trying to capture. Then, there was the challenge of how to preserve the microbial mix they were able to extract, inventory the product, and put it in a delivery vehicle so that the microbes could get into the patients they were interested in treating. At the beginning of Rebiotic's process of developing their own product, they started a dialogue with the FDA to understand how the product would be regulated. This was important because each type of product has different requirements for quality systems, clinical studies, regulatory submission formats, and other criteria. What they thought was a tissue transplant turned into a biologic drug product regulated by the FDA in its Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, CBER, in the Vaccines Division. This gave Rebiotics the direction, but because they were the first company to take microbiota-based therapeutic through the FDA, there were no standards or precedents to follow. Rebiotics found the most challenging aspect of drug development with a highly complex microbial mix 
was to define the potency and develop validated test methods to assure that their drug product met the quality release criteria. Over the past five years, the complexities around developing a microbiota-based drug have not diminished, even though progress has been made. The FDA, in its efforts to make sure that it did not stand in the way of a physician and their patient, unintentionally created a competitive nightmare for those that were developing drug products and complying with the regulatory process. The FDA released a guidance in 2013 whereby doctors using faecal microbiota transplants to treat recurrent CDI were not subject to enforcement of the normal FDA rules. As a result, several stool banks began supplying untested and unregulated products to the market, while newly formed companies seeking to develop microbiome-directed therapeutics had begun the challenging and costly process of identifying potential technologies for clinical testing as true pharmaceutical products. Companies are developing a wide range of microbiome therapies, encompassing the range of a single genetically modified microbe as the active ingredient, to a full-spectrum naturally occurring microbial mix, to using the metabolites produced by microbes and not the live microbes themselves as the therapeutic entity. Microbial products are being delivered via colonoscopy, enema, nasogastric roots, and via pills. Formulations are frozen, freeze-dried, stable at room temperature, or refrigerated. Indications have expanded from recurrent CDI to ulcerative colitis, multidrug-resistant infections, autism and obesity, among others. Great and exciting developments in a short amount of time. Though it remains to be seen which approach to the microbiome and which technology will emerge, the industry has been buoyed by recent clinical data that suggests the concept has considerable potential. As the first microbiome company to enter the clinic under FDA guidance, at the time of this article in 2016, Rebiotics had completed enrolment in three clinical trials, including the first multinational prospective randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial of a microbiota-based drug in the world. The results of those studies thus far have demonstrated the clinical efficacy of the therapeutic to prevent recurrent CDI in nearly 90% of the patients treated within the study protocols. What will the future hold for microbiome therapeutics? The National Microbiome Initiative has three goals, supporting interdisciplinary research, developing platform technologies, and expanding the microbiome workforce. Assuming that it is successful, we would expect to see more collaboration between Big Pharma, biotech, and academia to support microbiome product development and clinical applications. Several of these collaborations are already in progress. Nestle and Sarah's Therapeutics, Johnson & Johnson and Vedanta, and Synlogic and AbbVie, to name a few. Precision or personalised medicine will expand to include the microbiome. With that will come new diagnostic tools. Companies such as Enterome, Ubiome and Genetic Analysis are already working on them. Platform technologies will be developed, new indications will continue to expand, and products will become commercially available. Rebiotics is involved in a number of different feasibility studies for indications outside of CDI. Finally, the author anticipates that more investments will be made, and is excited to see what happens over the next 20 years, and very happy to be part of this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to shape a brand new industry, and potentially treat a host of diseases with a technology that at its essence has been inside of us and under our noses, for as long as time itself. This article was written by Lee Jones. Lee Jones is the founder, president and CEO of Rebiotics, a clinical stage biotechnology company focused on harnessing the power of the human microbiome to revolutionise the treatment of challenging diseases. She has more than 30 years of experience as a healthcare executive and entrepreneur, with large and small companies, and in academia. Lee founded Rebiotics in 2011, building the company around its pioneering microbiota restoration therapy, a drug technology platform that is designed to rehabilitate the human microbiome by delivering a broad spectrum of live microbes into a patient's intestinal tract. Today, 
Rebiotics is the most clinically advanced microbiome company in the industry. If you've enjoyed this episode, then you can subscribe to DDW free of charge by visiting ddw-online.com. And you can also view full articles including references and all of our back catalogue of old articles, including the PDFs. You can find the links to the article for this episode and the PDF in the show notes. If you've enjoyed the podcast, then as always, we'd massively appreciate a few seconds of your time to leave us a review. And you can also follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Thank you for listening, and we'll hope to see you in our next episode.